Everything you know about the French Revolution is wrong. What's up, All-Stars? Welcome to the School of Ireland. To be honest, what I said earlier was a bit of an overstatement. But the truth is that some of what you know about the French Revolution is probably wrong. But it's not your fault. You see, most world and European history textbooks that I've encountered explain the French Revolution as a struggle between haves and have-nots or the third estate against the monarchy and the first two estates. And while there was definitely some animosity between the members of the third estate and the clergy, nobility, and crown, the idea that the French Revolution came about solely as a struggle between classes is wrong. And the reason is, if you look at the grievance list or the cahiers of the nobility prior to the meeting of the Estates General, you will see that the nobility were pushing for many liberal reforms that the bourgeoisie representatives of the Third Estate were also pushing for. These grievances included things like a desire to get rid of arbitrary despotic government, the desire to create a constitution, equal taxation among the three estates, judicial reform, and much more. So with that said, the question becomes why? Why were these nobles willing to give up so many rights and privileges prior to the revolution? Also, which nobles, since they weren't a unified group, are we talking about here? Lastly, what happened? If the nobility was willing to put forth so many progressive reforms, why did everything break down in the end, resulting in revolution? And to find some answers to these questions, I've invited Professor William Doyle, who is a leading authority on the French Revolution, onto the channel to discuss these topics. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Professor Doyle, how are you doing today? Great, very nice to, very nice to be talking to you. <laughs> you too. I can't tell you how much of an honor and a privilege it is to get to talk with you today. Um, for those of you who don't know, Professor Doyle is one of the leading authorities on the French Revolution. He's written numerous works about the topic, including but not limited to uh, this Oxford History Survey on the French Revolution, this other book on the origins of the French Revolution, and much, much more. And the reason I wanted to talk to Professor Doyle today is that about three to four years ago, while I was getting ready to teach a lesson on the French Revolution, which I had taught numerous times before, I stumbled across some information that contradicted what was written in pretty much every high school world history, European history survey textbook out there. And the information that I found suggested something that in my mind completely blows the classical interpretation of the French Revolution out of the water. So what was it that I found? Well, first off, I feel that the classical interpretation of the revolution, and correct me if I'm wrong, teaches that the revolution was almost a Marxist one, haves versus have-nots, the third estate versus the first two estates, oppressors versus oppressed. But the information that I found totally contradicted this. What I stumbled upon was a piece of information that said that according to the cahier of the second estate, which were grievances written prior to the meeting of the Estates General, the nobility was willing to give up their financial tax privileges, and they were also willing to concede some other very liberal reforms. And this just kind of blew my mind. This goes against everything World History Survey high school textbooks teach. If true, this revolution, at least initially, was not one of the third estate against the first two estates and the monarchy. It was more like, at least to a degree, liberalism supported by some nobles of the second estate and some bourgeoisie of the third estate against despotic, arbitrary government. So with that said, I want to take part in changing the narrative of the revolution. I don't think the majority of high school teachers or students who have learned about this history-altering event know what really happened. And therefore, although these ideas are obviously not original, they're not mine, I want to be a vocal proponent of destroying the classical Marxist-based narrative on the origins of the French Revolution. So that's why I've invited you onto my channel today, because I have some questions that have come up as I've researched this topic over the past few years. So thank you so much for being here. I am truly honored. And to be honest, for those of us in the history world, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity right now. <laughs> so as 
most people know who have studied the French Revolution or have taught about the French Revolution, there were a lot of problems uh, uh, leading up to this event. You had, you know, the growing population, you had bad harvests, higher prices of goods, um, which affected a plethora of the population. But you also had um, big financial problems that the crown faced. And as a result, Louis the 16th called the Assembly of Notables. Can you go into a little bit of detail of why he called the Assembly of Notables and why did he not just rely on the parliaments to help him get across financial reform? Well, the parliaments were the only bodies with an official right to dispute what the king uh, was trying to do and so on. They couldn't stop him ultimately, but they could criticize him and so on. Um, and he learns in the mid 1780s that because of a century really of, uh, of overstretched military expenditure, if you like, um, there is a big financial problem. There's a big problem coming up uh, and the American War of Independence, the final one of those great wars of the 18th century has been um, financed largely by loans, and some of those loans are going to be falling due in the course of the uh, 1790s. So they're looking ahead to some way of dealing with this, and they realize the crisis is so big, or at least the king's uh, finance minister, Calon, realizes the crisis is so big that he needs a comprehensive system of reform to uh, actually confront it. And it's going to be such a big um, program that he's going to put forward that he feels he's got to get the public behind him and he's got to get educated opinion behind him. And he thinks that perhaps the best way to do this is to summon a, a very old institution that hasn't been an assembly of notables since the 17th century, uh, uh, but summon this body of, of, of what nowadays we call the great and the good uh, important people in the country, people of influence, people who will be listened to, um, to endorse this program, because he feels if that happens, it, he will carry the public with him. And, and if he carries the public with him, it will, in some ways, induce the parlements to go along with it too, because the parlements have been increasingly sceptical since the end of the war uh, at uh, uh, ever-increasing demands for loans and so on. I mean, what the Parliament never seem to recognize is that, you know, the cost of a war goes on long after the war is over, yes. in fact. And that's the real problem which the government is facing. It's, it's, it's post-war expenditure, if you like. Um, and he, Callan feels that if, if you can get this consensus that the really important people in the country uh, will approve of his plan, then it will be much easier to get it through all the other constitutional procedures. So if you look at the membership of the Assembly of Notables, it's really important people. Uh, it's former ministers, it's former uh, uh, high civil servants, it's archbishops, it's the most important nobles in the country, and a very large contingent of members of the parliaments, in fact, are also members of that body. Uh, these are important people who make the government actually work from day to day. Um, and if you can get them behind this program, then uh, it, it should be much easier to get it through. Did this assembly of notables ever have any intentions to uh, agreeing to Louis' tax reforms? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there was there was a great deal of, of goodwill, you know. But what they what they say to him is show us the evidence that there's a problem. Let's see the scale of the problem. And to start with, he doesn't do that, uh, Calon. He comes along and says, look, we got this financial problem. These are the, uh, what we propose, uh, the measures we propose to actually deal with it, but we're not telling you what it is. We're not telling you how big it is. And they say, well, come on, you know, uh, we, we've got to know what this, what this is. And only slowly are they able to, uh, to, to, to wheedle out of him what the various problems are. Uh, and as soon as they uh, that they see this expenditure, they say, "Well, who's responsible for this? Was it was this uh, inefficient government? And if it's inefficient government, was it you <laughs> who actually <laughs> created the problem?" Um, so here you are uh, offering, uh, 
getting trying to persuade us to offer solutions to problems that you have created. Why then did these notables want to ultimately pass the buck on to the Estates General? Well, b- because they feel that uh, they're not getting through. They're not actually uh, uh, able to uh, uh, <clears throat> to get through to the to, to the king. What, what what really needs to be done, and, and to persuade the the the, the, the government that the, 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 uh, there ought to be institutions in place which will actually oversee any sort of big innovations in taxation and everything else like that. And uh, in the course of the discussions, people begin to think, well, look, this is so radical. And these discussions are spun out as well. And, you know, uh, people's opinions evolve during discussions. And they eventually begin to, some of them anyway, begin to say, look, this is so big. We've got to go to an assembly which really represents the nation. We don't represent the nation. We're a handpicked bunch of elites, if you like. Uh, it, it, these uh, uh, reforms are so radical, they're going to affect so many people in so many ways that there ought to be some sort of national consent to it. So let's uh, go for the Estates General. Now, not all of them go for that, but uh, important ones do. Uh, and once that idea is around, when the Assembly of Notables ends, the Parliament sees on it immediately and say, look, we've got to have the Estates General. Uh, because only that can prevent the government from bulldozing through um, this, it, it, these in, in, enormously wide plans. So, so the Estates General was like a, a barrier against despotism. Well, that's that's it, it would be resurrected as that. It's the mm-hmm. only historical national representative assembly that France has ever had. And okay, it hasn't met for 175 years. Uh, but nevertheless, it's there in the precedence. It, it was there once. Uh, it, it, at various points, it played quite important parts in, in, in the evolution of, of early modern France and so on. And, and this is what we've got. Uh, so let's, let's resurrect it. Let's, let's, uh, let's have it as, as the national representative uh, that will deal with the, with the monarchy. What, how much power did the estates general actually have? Was that clear? No, that's the whole point. It's not clear at all. People say, the Estates General, the Estates General, that's what we want. And then it's only at the end of the summer of 1788 when the, when the government has financially collapsed and people say, we're going to have the Estates General. Suddenly they look around and say, well, okay, what is the Estates General? What does it do? Who does it represent? What will its powers be? Uh, uh, and there's a tremendous searching around in the precedents and so on, but also the government has said, tell us what you think, tell us what you would like. Um, so it's really open. Um, and it's the process of, 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 of defining what the Estates General is going to do, which is, is the earliest stage of the revolution. Do you think the revolution, and this is obviously speculation, would have happened if the parliaments or the notables would have agreed to the taxes that Louis wanted? Probably not, I think. Probably not. Uh, if, if, if it had gone through the... You know, you only need a revolution if you haven't got procedures which uh, allow things to happen normally. Uh, uh, and, and that's the real problem. A revolution is a break in the chain of everything because you can't get through otherwise. But if they'd, the king had managed to get this plan endorsed by the various... Uh, uh, procedures uh, by, by the by the parliaments uh, and, and had been approved by the assembly of notables as well. Then it it would have gone through, I think. So, would you argue that the financial crisis was the biggest cause of the French Revolution, or was it something oh, else? Absolutely, absolutely. It's the it's the financial collapse of the of the absolute monarchy, which precipitates everything else. Because you know, the bankruptcy of the summer of 1788, that opens the way to the Estates General and all the questions about what the Estates General are going to do. And that raises principles of who's to be represented and how and on what basis and what it's actually going to do. All those things, all those things uh, come up because the government has collapsed, or at least its power has collapsed because of the financial collapse. So 
I'm going to put um, a quote up on the screen so that you and the viewers are able to follow along. Can you extrapolate upon what the author of the French nobility in the 18th century is um, saying here? Now, first, obviously, it's a question. So the question he poses, and, and you translated this book for the audience to know, um, the question he poses is, why in 1789, did the nobility oppose so many of the financial reforms sought and pursued by the reforming ministers of Louis the 15th and 16th? Even though they went on to propose so many radical reforms, the nobles, that is, in the cahier. And then the author's answer is this. The stock answer is that the nobility were systematically hostile to all questioning of the advantages that they had gained. And any change likely to affect the existing state of things, an analysis of the Kaye undermines this hypothesis and enables us to explain this apparent last minute change of attitudes. In fact, the nobility could not allow ministerial despotism. They constantly denounced bugbear, yet further to subject the nation as personified by themselves to its arbitrary power when they thought of themselves as the last redoubt of liberties against the omnipotence of government. On the contrary, from the moment that the announcement of the meeting of the States General uh, gave the nation back some basic guarantees, the nobility no longer hesitated to give up what henceforth was no longer a defense against arbitrary power, but an obstacle to the nation's freedom to subject all its citizens to a common law. So long as the reforms were imposed from above by ministers, for nobles to accept them was less to lose material advantage than to give up the last remnants, which kept up the tradition of and desire for freedom among a minority at least. Seen from this viewpoint, the resistance of the privilege takes on the character of a struggle against despotism. Now, that's a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's let's go back to this question here. Um, and do you mind just kind of summarizing and kind of extrapolating on what um, the author meant here. Well, I mean, he's reacting against uh, the um, the narrative which you talked about at the beginning of our conversation. In fact, uh, that uh, it, it is a matter of um, of social antagonisms and so on. Whereas the the, the, the nobility, the, the coherent, educated nobility, anyway, and they weren't all educated by any means. Uh, uh, increasingly take the line that what's wrong with the country is despotism, is the, is the unlimited power of the king to do whatever he likes and so on. And this is a, a, when they're, they're, they're uh, in conflict for much of the century against the country where the king is limited, the Great Britain, obviously. And then, of course, they see uh, the, the, <laughs> the power of Great Britain challenge from across the Atlantic as well and uh, they're well aware that uh, the 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 that uh, representative government is something which uh, which is able to restrain the unlimited power of gov of, 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 of monarchies and, and uh, uh, feel that there, there's the, the opportunity in france to have a, a, some sort of representation as well whereas the parlements of course which are the only body as i said at the beginning which is which have the right uh, to 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 challenge what the king's doing? They are magistrates who have bought their officers. They are not elected in any way, and they they, they see themselves as the only voice of the nation against uh, royal despotism, but the, uh, an inadequate one. And in fact, uh, uh, the first mentions of the Estates General come in 1771 at a time when the uh, uh, Louis XV is attacking the power of the parlements and trying to and trying to limit them. So people more and more begin to see the problem that the country has got is of a government which is unrestrained, um, and and nobles feel themselves as the perhaps as the social elite and, and the richest group in the country, if you like, as the best place to restrain the excesses of despotism. Can you? Give some examples of the ministerial despotism that was going on. Well, I mean, the, the big the big crunch moment comes actually in 1771. In 1771, um, 
Louis the Fifteenth backs Ch Chancellor Moku in his uh, uh, campaign to to muzzle the parliaments, to remodel the parliaments, to cut down their power of remonstrance and registration uh, and so on. And at that same moment, the finance minister actually uh, renounces a number of the government's debts. So here is a government which is which is uh, um, uh, attacking any institutions that can resist and at the same time renouncing its own debts to some degree. Uh, that's despotism. That's that's unrestrained government in some ways. And the memory of that, remember, this is 1771. So it's only, uh, uh, it's less than 20 years before uh, the, the crisis of the end of the 1780s. Uh, it's in everybody's mind. Um, what we really need is, is reforms which, which institutionalize some sort of clear restraints on what government can do. Um, uh, and and respond to what the public wants. Would the uh, intendants also be an example of this despotism? Totally, completely, because they are they are the instruments of central government. Uh, they are there to do what the government tells them to do. They don't operate with the consent of anybody else in in most of the country uh, anyway. Um, and. Uh, uh, they're instruments to what they call ministerial despotism, um, and, and they're unrestrained. They're only responsible to the king. They're not responsible to anybody else. They have enormous administrative power, so, and they, they symbolize in many ways uh, uh, what, what people see as wrong with the way the country is, is governed. How did one become an intendant? Oh, well, uh, they, they are recruited through a very elitist process, in effect. They're all recruited mostly from the magistracy. Mostly they come from the, the, uh, uh, the, the body of, of senior office holders, in effect. Um, and they all actually do hold uh, uh, offices, uh, which, which they bought as well. Most of them are what they call masters of requests, and that, that's a very expensive office. But what it does is give you access to the central government uh, machinery, and it's from the people who are serving the central government machinery that the intendants are recruited and nominated. So they're bought positions um, and are most intendants originally from the third estate, the bourgeois? No, no. on the contrary. Most of them are from the nobility of the robe. Okay. Uh, the, the, the judicial uh, nobility uh, in effect. Can Actually, I guess we can get, go into that now. What is the difference between the nobility of the robe and the nobility of the sword? Well, technically speaking, the nobility of the robe are people who have bought officers which have conferred nobility upon them and their families, whereas the nobility of the sword claim, anyway, to go back into the mists of time, uh, their hereditary and, and, and their natural function in society they see as to fight. Um, whereas the nobility of the robe, if you like, what, what, what's, what some people call now pen pushers, uh, <laughs> people who uh, 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 rise through uh, the law and through administration and so on and have bought their offices. Um, so, uh, and, and there is a, you know, the, the nobility of the, of, of, the, of the sword rather disdain the nobility of the robe. They, they regard themselves as superior, but they're all nobles and they all um, enjoy a certain body of noble privileges. And I guess continuing along kind of that line of thought, um, these individuals who have bought these positions, would they have once come from the bourgeois class? Ultimately, yeah, way yeah. back, yes. Okay. I mean, because somebody, somebody eventually, at one point buys an office. Okay. And that gets you into a hierarchy of officers. And, and, and uh, over the generations, what would happen is that you would move up and eventually, the ultimately, you would buy an office which carried a noblement. That's, that's a quite, you know, there are 70,000 uh, 70, officers for sale uh, in, and, 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 and hereditary in 18th century France, but there are only uh, about 3,000 which confer nobility. Interesting. Did Louis the Sixteenth? truly think that the estates general would grant him more taxes or was calling the estates general a last ditch effort since everything else failed up until this point? 
No, I think once the, the government has committed to calling the Estates General, um, they know that they are going to have to negotiate uh, deals with them. You know, they've not called them together just to announce things. Uh, uh, and, and, and the great opening speech which Necker gives at the beginning of the Estates General, which lasts for three hours, you know, his voice gives out halfway through, <laughs> uh, 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 sets out a program of financial reform, which he expects the Estates General to enact. In effect, so the the, the, the king is, is is clear that that that, that um, the Estates General is going to be integral to the way France is governed from then on. Now, this next question is a question that I've wanted to dive into for years, mm. in more detail than what I can you know get in books, and it kind of I'll resummarize some of the stuff I already said at the beginning, but. I feel like the classic interpretation of the French Revolution that's presented in most high school and university survey textbooks on mm. world history and European history is that the second estate, at worst, wanted to keep the status quo and maintain their privileges going into the estates mm. general. Or at mm. best, they wanted to gain more power and influence in the government. However, mm. if one reads the cahier or grievances that the second estate had prior to the meeting of the estates general, it seems like the nobility, or at least a portion of the nobility, was saying, hey, we're willing to be taxed equally with the third estate, even though historically we received privileges and exemptions. And not only that, let me put this up on the screen here. And not only that, um, you have other very liberal progressive um, ideas that the second estate nobility push for, or at least give lip service to in their cahier. So right here, we can see that of all the cahier that exist of just the second estate, not the first, not the third, 88% yeah. push for equality of taxation. Only 3% argued that the king was sacred and inviolable. Only 17% argued that nobles should keep their, signorial privileges, 50% wanted a constitution, 88% free speech, 22% wanted to abolish hereditary office and 44% abolish venal offices. 24% yeah. uh, said that ennoblement should be based on merit, 41% mm -hmm. monopolies abolish, 41% national education to be improved plus schools for all classes and almost 20% of the total complaints dealt with individual rights, implementing due process, judicial reform. Yeah. So when looking at these Kaye, why were the nobles saying this? Why were the nobles willing to be taxed on an equal level with the third estate? Why were they willing to renounce their privileges as members of the second estate? This goes against everything these survey texts say. Yeah, well... <clears throat> The first thing I always say about the cahiers, if people ask you for your opinion, you tell them. And it almost asking almost creates opinion in many ways. You know, uh, 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 you ask people what they think about a particular issue and they might say, well, I haven't actually thought about that very much. But since you ask, well, this will be a good idea and that would be a good idea. And the Kaye are, are, are an unprecedented occasion. I mean, they're the first great public opinion poll in modern history, in fact, they're, they're actually remarkable. Um, and uh, it, they, they actually stimulate people to think about big public issues. Um, and many nobles regard their job as, as leaders of the community to think responsibly about the way the community should be run. Um, and right, even in the Assembly of Notables, even the Assembly of Notables uh, uh, says, you know, well, we accept the idea of equality of taxation for nobles. They don't, they, they, no nobles really oppose that at all, in, in fact, or at least very few of them actually do. What nobles want, in, in 89, first of all, in 89, they see it's an opportunity to exercise power collectively, which nobles have never had before. You know, in, in, in Great Britain, you have the House of Lords. Now, okay, that, those are great lords. They're, they're, uh, 
uh, it, it is different in all sorts of ways. But nevertheless, they look across the channel and they say, look, here, there you have a house of nobility which has real power. Now, couldn't we have something of that sort? I mean, they, they haven't really thought through what that would actually involve. And once they do start to think it through, the problems really arise. But that's the first thing. The, the Estates General are an opportunity to institutionalize noble power, something they haven't had before. Um, and rip uh, it away but, from the king and the king's arbitrariness. And... Yes, yes, to, 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 to balance the power of the king in a constitution. That's interesting, you know, the, the, the number who want a constitution. I mean, and that's the consensual thing, really, right throughout the cahiers of all three estates. We want a constitution. And the fundamental uh, aim of the French Revolution, right from the start, is to turn an absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. And that means drafting a constitution. So the nobles are all in favor of that. But of course, it, like saying, let's have the Estates General, let's have a constitution. Okay, what's going to be in that constitution? How is it actually going to work? Um, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's a subject of contestation between people making claims on, on, on what should actually be uh, instituted as, as, as a, a way forward, the way France is going to govern itself in the future. Was the willingness of the nobility to give up uh, signorial privileges or equality and taxation, uh, especially equality and taxation, I guess, based on the reality of France's financial situation, or was it something more intellectually meaningful? Yeah, well, it's both. It's both, I think. I mean, they're, they're perfectly clear that the financial situation has brought this thing about. And there's something's got to be done by everybody to resolve that situation. Okay. And, 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 and what lots of those, that big majority of nobles say is, okay, we, we play our part in that. You know, we'll give up our financial privileges and so on. Um, and uh, uh, we, we want to participate in, 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 in doing things that way, I think. Uh, what one should never, the thing which the, the, old interpretation, which you keep talking about, you know, which we're trying to pull apart uh, on, on this occasion. What that is based upon is that people always pursue their material interests. Now, I, I, it seems to me the evidence doesn't suggest that people always do at all. People do all sorts of things for all sorts of very irrational reasons, uh, in effect. Uh, and, and you can't understand the French Revolution, I think, without understanding that lots of people at the time felt altruistic. They felt, we've got to make a, a sacrifice. We've got to do things to get the country out of the crisis it's in. And, and uh, uh, you've got to key in, I think, that altruism. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I've been at conferences and uh, talking to people and, and they say, well, why did such and such a thing happen? And I say, well, altruism. And they knit their brows and say, altruism and you think look around you people are altruistic all the time and i think at this particular time uh uh huge numbers of people at all all the estates say this is the moment when we've got to play our part in regenerating the country so it definitely makes sense that the nobles wanted to pull power uh, away from the king and, and share in that power and then yeah. you mentioned the altruism in terms of giving up those privileges was it was there anything more than that was it like enlightenment uh, ideology saying hey you know what it's it let's make society a little more um, or let's make society a little bit more fair for all or what was going on there yeah, yeah, I think so yeah I mean the the, the the influence of enlightenment ideas is, is absolutely enormous and uh, and uh, the whole idea of despotism is one that's focused by Enlightenment thinkers. And in fact, going back to Montesquieu, really, um, uh, is, is the one at the root of all that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the climate of ideas at the time event is obviously going to influence the way people respond and do things, I think. And, and, that's, uh, <coughs> and that affects the nobility as much as, uh, as much as anybody else. The one thing the nobility don't, want to do all the way through is give up the idea that they are a separate group of people they are 
nobles, they, they get it from their blood and everything else like that. And, and they say, you know, this doesn't imply necessarily any material advantages, but you know, we are what we are and we are nobles and you can't take that away from us. And, and, and you don't, we don't want institutions which do try and take it away from us. We're citizens as well. Okay, you know, we do our civic duty, but we are nobles and we are different in that sense. And you should recognize that difference. And uh, and uh, when eventually in, in June 1790, the, um, the, the Constituent Assembly actually tries to abolish nobility, a lot of the nobles say, well, that's, that's very fine, you can't do it. We are nobles, you know, we, we, we got the blood that we inherited, and you can't abolish it. Um, and, and, and that is one of the, the, the trend towards that, which is there right from the beginning uh, of the Estates General because of the clashes between the, the three orders. Um, in, in, in May. Um, uh, this is something which, which drives the nobility into defensive positions, which they weren't uh, uh, setting up in, at the time the Kanyas were being written. You know, so in, in other words, the rush of events in some ways radicalizes <laughs> um, uh, people in, in, in opposite directions. It makes some of the third estate tremendously radical. And, and it makes the nobles radical in a, in, a, in, a, in a conservative sense. You know, it makes them more conservative because they feel they're under attack in their very nature. Um, so you, it seems that you argue altruism is the predominant reason why they were willing to give up a lot of these privileges. Well, um, it's very important. And mm. was it also kind of the politics of reality, like we want to move forward as a nation we have yeah. to give the third estate some of these these rights or absolutely absolutely yes yes and uh, it's it, it's actually a body made mostly of nobles which which launches the campaign for doubling the third estate and vote by head uh, the famous committee of 30 which comes together in in september um uh, <clears throat> 1788 and uh, uh, it's been shown you know that this is a body of nobles entirely and they're the ones who actually say to the bourgeoisie say to the third estate look come on come on get together um and and and, and uh, uh, make a case for yourselves in fact and, and it works very well, it, it well were... <laughs> <laughs> yes um yeah. weren't some pretty elite nobles part of that society of 30 Absolutely, yes, yes. Great dukes, lords, uh, important people. Yeah, they're you know they're part of the Parisian intellectual elite, in effect. Yeah, um, and uh, there was a big controversy um, ooh, years ago now uh, uh, over the question of of of, uh, of 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 what radicalizes the bourgeoisie uh, in 1788 and so on. And uh, the American historian Elizabeth Eisenstein. Uh, she was tremendously influential. She wrote the, a, a, a good article saying, who intervened in 1788? And, and she makes the point, you know, that it's, it's, it's the nobles prodding the third estate saying, get going, organize yourself, uh, which, which, which uh, brings that about. One thing your book and one thing this book, the French Revol uh, excuse me, the French mm -hmm. nobility in the 18th century point out is mm -hmm. that the nobility is not one homogeneous group. Absolutely. It's very divided. Um, yeah. In fact, the nobles can be divided into five different groups based on wealth. They are also split uh, because of that wealth uh, into nobles of good education and those who did not have good education. The yeah. split between the nobility of the robe and the sword existed. There was a split yeah. between the court nobles and the country nobles. And exactly. yes. there was also mm -hmm. a split between the old nobles and then the new nobles who had Yep, typically yep. bought their positions. Yeah. So with that said, which group or groups of nobles were the ones pushing for these liberal, liberal reforms seen in the Kaye? Well, it, it, it transcended the different, the, the, the different divisions, I think. You know, some of them are great court nobles, important people like Lafayette is a, perhaps best known and so on, uh, the Duc de Lioncourt, others as well. Um, but also leading members of the um, of, of of the parliaments, for instance, Adrien Dupont, who's the man who uh, um, uh, hosts the Society of Thirty, and so on, or people like Mirabeau, who's a, a, a journalist, uh, uh, a younger noble without uh, 
uh, means of his own. So the, the, the cause of, of, uh, of constitutional reform draws in nobles from the different parts and so on. But on the other hand, it's very difficult for them to all unite, I think, behind uh, any particular uh, point of view once the um, process of, 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 of the states general meeting and, and uh, being elected comes along. And once you've got the elections, of course, you know, elections polarize. You vote for some people and you hope you, other people don't get in and so on. And, 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 and that enables many of those old antagonisms to come out, I think, and, 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 and sows the seeds of the fact that the nobility are never actually able to unite among themselves to resist anything. I guess piggybacking off that question, which nobility would have been like most opposed to these reforms? Who were the most status quo oh, conservative? Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it's the old nobility of the sword in the end who, uh, who are most of them, uh, uh, you know, they have great leaders who aren't, but uh, uh, most of them are, tend to be uh, very conservative. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> many of them have, have been elected. This is the, some of them. It's their first experience of any sort of public life at all, and they're elected by their local uh, constituencies and so on. They come along, and they 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 have a, a very conservative viewpoint. And when they arrive, they find members of the third estate attacking them, attacking their uh, privileges, uh, uh, attacking their position in society, and so on. And 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 uh, their reaction is to dig in. So my next question is this, during the Estates General, when it came time to vote upon whether registration uh, for the credentials of all three estates, uh, whether it was to be done together or separately, which yes. implicitly was a vote for, um, should voting be done by order or by head, That's the, it. the nobles were divided 188 to 46 with only mm. 46 implying outright that votes should be counted by head and not a state. Yeah. yeah. And in your book, you identify these 46 as the liberal minority. So yeah. what, this seems to go against the Kaye, like the, the, there's only a liberal minority when in the Kaye, it seemed like a lot of liberal reforms were being pushed for. What's, what's starting to happen mm. here? And I think you started to touch on it, but I want to kind of dive into that more. Yeah. Well, the real issue is, is when the Estates General actually come together, they are three separate houses. Now, one of them is, is, is in size, uh, the equivalent of the other two and so on, but they are three separate houses and they're told when the Estates, when, when, as, as soon as the opening ceremony is over, okay, separate, go to your own places, go to your own houses. The nobility see this as their opportunity to do what we were talking about earlier on, which is to establish a separate role for nobles in the way the estate is going to, uh, the, the way that the state is going to operate in the future. And therefore they stick to their separate situation. Uh, the clergy, likewise, they've got their own, in, um, their, 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 their own interests and their own privileges and everything else like that. And uh, it's the third estate who say, come on now, this is a national occasion. Uh, we've got to unite, um, but uh, the, the nobility, you know, see their chance of a of a, a, a permanent political role shrinking away if they just blended into the generality. Um, now that small, that liberal mi minority say, well, okay, that's fine. You know, uh, uh, we're all citizens. Uh, let's uh, let's not uh, uh, let's not be divided in this sort of way. Uh, but you know, it's it, 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 it's the way the traditional organisations seem to be forcing people, as it were. And uh, uh, the break comes, you know, when the the, the third estate say to hell with this, uh, uh, we we are going to set ourselves up as the national assembly. And that's the that's the, that's the break. You see, it's, it's again what we were talking on yeah. about what revolutions are about. I mean, if 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 they'd all come together happily there wouldn't have been these antagonisms, but the third estate eventually has to go alone. And, and that's the great break because the third estate says, right, we are the national assembly um, and we have sovereignty in the country. We are taking power. 
in effect. And that's the moment, you know, the revolutionary moment, the 17th of June, 1789, because that's the declaration of the National Assembly, the seizure by the, uh, the Third Estate of national sovereignty and so on, taking sovereignty away from the king. Got another quote I'll put up on the screen here for you. So this comes from your Origins of the French Revolution book. Yeah. Behind the arguments over voting in the estates, in fact, there lay a broad reformist liberal consensus, which transcended all three orders. Once they had finally united in 1789, the way was clear for this consensus to become the basis for the National Assembly's reforming activities until 1791. But before that could happen, the great outstanding obstacle had to be cleared away. And this proved more difficult than anybody had imagined. In the process, suspicions, resentments, and antagonisms were aroused that the idealistic cahier uh, drafters of the spring could not have dreamed of. The uniting of the orders, indeed, was only achieved by the intervention of an element which had no place in the liberal consensus, the common people. So mm -hmm. I think we've kind of touched on a few of these questions just barely, but I want to kind of expand upon this. So in regards to this quote, um, what were the outstanding obstacles that you speak of here? Well, the, the, uh, first of all, the, the, the division of the Estates General into the three houses. That's the, that's the, the great one there, I think. Um, um, <clears throat> and, and that that comprehends everything else, in effect, because you know until that's got out of the way, until things can be done collectively, uh, then uh, you can't you can't really move forward, and nor, nor could they. But nothing did move forward for weeks on end while that was there. It's only by getting rid of that. Um, but it is a background. The reason I mentioned the common people, I mean, it, it, this is all happening against the background of a severe economic crisis of rising prices, of, 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 of uh, increasing scarcity of bread, and so on. And the clergy, the one thing that drives the clergy into uh, recognizing the uniting of the orders eventually is they say, look, 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 people are starving. You know, we've got to, we've got to get moving. We've got to get things going rather than just be paralyzed the way we are. Uh, and that's the thing which, which saps the, the, the solidarity of the clerical estate, if you like, and eventually gets it... Uh, it's divided itself between noble bishops and uh, 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 third estate uh, uh, ordinary priests and so on. Uh, so th that's the thing, you know, you've got to get rid of the division between the orders. And once that's done successfully, then you can move forward to a, a sort of consensual constitution. And then in the quote here, kind of... Uh where it says, in the process, suspicions, resentments, antagonisms were aroused that the idealistic, idealistic Kaye drafters of the spring could not have dreamed of. Could you mm. dive into that? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's nobles beginning to say, look, they're attacking us. You know, we've got to, we've got to maintain our separateness because the third estate are uh, <coughs> attacking uh, the whole basis of our, of our, um, prestige in society and our privileges and so on and and uh, and, and in, if, if, if that that succeeds what's going to happen to the whole idea of nobility this is suspicions uh, the, the 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 worries of the clergy about people starving and so on the worries of other clergy that the privileges of the church which are far more extensive in many ways than the privileges of nobility are going to be got rid of and not and the, the interests of the church are not going to be um uh, uh, recognized and accepted uh, if the church gives up its separate uh, uh, representation as well. So, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the fact that they're in separate situations immediately makes them focus on their separate interests um, and realize that these in many ways are clashing with those of other orders. Um, you know, it's the way that the institutional structure actually makes people think in ways that they otherwise wouldn't have done. And is it because of this, these suspicions, that it takes until 
the great fear and the August social revolution for the nobility to kind of get back on board with kind of some of the ideas that were laid out in the Kaye? Well, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the attack on feudalism, for instance, I mean, say uh, <coughs> that results from the disorder in the countryside. The disorder in the countryside, and uh, at the begin, the, uh, the 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 end of uh, July, they come together. People come together and say, "Look, what can we do to calm the countryside down? What we've got to do is get rid of feudal burdens." So the nobility, uh, or nobles anyway, are people who actually launch the night of the fourth of August, which is the most radical night of the whole French Revolution in the sense it gets rid of the whole socio-economic structure of the Ancien regime, in effect, by getting rid of feudalism, getting rid of the sale of offices, getting rid of uh, privileges, getting rid of, finally, of sort of tax exemption. All those things go in one night, on the night of the 4th of August. That's launched by nobles who want to actually calm things down because it looks as if the populace are getting out of control. In another interview, you talk about how a large portion of the nobility was willing to give up venal offices or offices that could be bought. Um, and it, once again, in this book, it talks about how the kind of ideology of nobility has shifted um, in, in the 18th century. So for example, historically, nobility kind of look to their blood and heritage, as you mentioned earlier, as kind of the foundational thing for why we're nobility. And then when there were a lot of bourgeoisie buying up these offices, um, the kind of ideology of blood started to somewhat be pushed aside for, hey, we should look at ourselves um, based off of merit. Um, yeah. And so is this idea of merit the predominant reason why they wanted to get rid of these these venal offices or was it something else yeah well the thing about merit is what what is merit merit <laughs> is in some ways in the eyes of the beholder you know as yeah. far as the nobles as a, no, a sword noble was concerned merit is the ability to uh, uh, to, to have military training and to be prepared to fight. That's merit as far as they're concerned. As far as a, a nobility uh, uh, of the robe is concerned, merit is, 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 is knowledge of the law, ability to judge the law and everything else. That. Merit is a, is a, is a very uh, interesting concept as well, and it's a contestable concept all the way through. But what really hit me, I mean, after I wrote that book, some time after I wrote it, I spent a lot of time working on the sale of offices, um, uh, really through the 18th century. And, and, and towards the end of it, there's a huge chapter upon the abolition of offices by the revolutionaries. And what really struck me about that is that when the revolutionaries say, right, these offices represent property, people have paid out money for them, they've got the monetary value and so on. They've obviously got to be compensated if we abolish them. We can't abolish them outright, and, and, and no one thinks that they actually should. Uh, so they say, okay, what's the basis upon which we will reimburse them? How do we assess the value of some officers that were bought 200 years ago and haven't changed hands since, uh, or officers that were bought yesterday, and everything else like that? And they say, well, there's one way. In 1771, um, there was a general re-evaluation of officers. And if we go back to 1771 and say, look, we've got uh, valuations for all the officers that we're going to abolish, that's absolutely great. Okay, let's use that as a basis for compensation. But since 1771, it's a, an age of enormous inflation, in fact. So the estimates of 1771 are far lower than the market value of officers by the end of the 1780s and so on. Uh, so they're going to lose out if they're, if, if, they're, uh, if they're compensated on the 1771 basis. But the Revolutionary Assembly, the Assembly says, that's true, but, you know, how else are we going to get rid of it? We have got to make that sacrifice. And it's made, undoubtedly. It's not really contested very much. Um, and, and that's the remarkable thing, it seems to me, that the abolition of venality by an assembly 
half of whose members had links with venality of one sort or another, compensated for themselves at a loss. Now, if that's not altruism, I don't know what is. And this is what really struck me when I looked at the at the at what they tried to do and 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 the the means they adopted to do it. See, these people are making sacrifices in order to get through an important um, uh, reform, a reform of, of a system which actually, and I also looked at this in the book as well, you know, what did people think about it in the 18th century? Everyone said it's wrong. You shouldn't be able to sell officers. Uh, uh, officers should be appointed on, on, on merit and ability and everything else like that. But we can't get rid of it. You know, what can you do? We can't get rid of it. We can't afford to compensate people. The revolutionary does that. The revolution does that compensation, but it does it by saying, well, look, actually, you know, we can't, we can't do it on a, on, a, on a fair basis, but it's got to be done. So we, we have to accept this sacrifice. And I apologize. There's a lot of assemblies and conventions. Uh, are we talking about the National Assembly here that gets rid of it? Yeah, I'm talking about the Constituent Assembly, yes, yeah. Mm. Why, in your opinion, is the French Revolution significant? Now, you probably write a whole book on it, but what's the <laughs> one big thing that you want people to take away when they study or learn about this event? It's the beginning of modern political culture in, 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 in a whole range of ways. I mean, it's uh, it, it, the, the very idea of national sovereignty the very idea of a declaration of rights uh, underpinning a constitution, uh, the very uh, <coughs> idea of, of, of bringing the people into, in, in, into politics for the first time and giving them a, a legitimate uh, uh, role in politics. And it, it's, it even is the origin of modern conservatism because people uh, uh, have to think about, if, if they don't like what's happening, they've got to think about why, and, and modern conservatism, just as modern liberalism, go back to the French Revolution. There's absolutely no doubt. Uh, so, you know, as, as, if, if you want to encapsulate all that, as I say, it's the beginning of modern political culture. And after it, nothing can ever be the same again. Uh, 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 and the great thing is, you know, under the old regime, the old regime, things were the way they were because they always had been that way that w they were, and you couldn't really change things except in a very incremental way, change this, change that, and so on. You couldn't do things comprehensively. What the Re French Revolution shows is you don't have to accept that. You can start again, you can start fresh. It might not work out, and, and it, it could have horrible consequences, <laughs> but you can do it. And people didn't think you could do it before then. And, and that's the fundamental thing. I think it emancipates people's sense of what they can do, what they can achieve. Well, that's awesome. Professor Doyle, thank you so much for your time. This was an absolutely enjoyable discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.